we are, yeah, that's right. So this is a very special um, evening because it is the uh, Rose Patronic Lecture. And that is to celebrate one of our uh, wonderful customers who passed away a few years ago, who uh, did many interesting things and did love books, but she was also uh, the diversity and inclusion officer at Marquette University for 27 years. And uh, she worked very hard to uh, bring opportunities for both women and people of color. And um, her sister, Kate, has been gracious enough to work with us on several programs. And so a number of students who are here tonight, uh, if you got uh, a book through us, uh, which you didn't have to pay for, it was through part of this program. So um, to get books into hands of folks like you. So I'm going to have um, uh, Rose's sister, Kate, uh, give a, say a few words. You also got a little envelope that tells more about her on your seats. Why don't you come up? I'm thrilled to be here. I, uh, when my sister died unexpectedly um, uh, in 2018, I, I wanted something that would honor her in a way that would sort of match up with who she was and what she was uh, in love with and crazy about. And it happened to be books. Um, I think that uh, it was one of the main treasures of her life was to come here and listen to the readings of the various people that, that came in and out of this bookstore. And so she's alive in this bookstore, even though she may not be with us here today. Um, as Daniel mentioned, I created a little thing for, to sort of explain the sort of the origin of, the, of this program, and also a little bit about Rose, which you can take a look at rather than taking up our time today, because I know we all want to hear you know who. So <laughs> without further ado, as they say, may I turn the microphone back? So um, as you know, um, Crying in the Bathroom has been, um, some of you, the book actually came out in July and originally this event was going to be in July and we worked with uh, Rebecca Marsh, the um, publicist and said, oh, please, 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 can we wait till school starts? And so we're so grateful to her actually for um, that as well as our author tonight. Um, the book is just uh, spectacular. Um, if I may just give one quote, it's from uh, Shamila Mukherjee in the Star Tribune blazingly honest and gloriously raucous. The memoir is about the author's struggle to forge a life of her choosing without viable role models. I want to give a couple of thanks. Uh, we're wor working with uh, Marquette University and Jackie Black, and then also uh, the Mount Mary Grace, hello. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the Mount Mary Grace Scholars Program and uh, Carol Barrowman at the um, Alverno College's uh, English department and a few other uh, folks who are not in the English department, but just are coming. Um, I also wanted to give a special thanks as always to Kelly Saunders, who is the program coordinator to Story Milwaukee and the UWM Peck School of the Arts. And I'm not exactly sure if I got her title right, but whatever she does, she does like 10 times more than whatever her title says. So um, Erica Sanchez is a Mexican-American poet, novelist, and essayist. Her poetry collection, Lessons on Expulsion, was a finalist for the Pen America Open Book Award. Her YA novel, I Am Not Your Perfect Mexican Daughter, was a New York Times bestseller, a National Book Award finalist, and is now being made into a film directed by America Ferreira. Sanchez, I don't know. So I thought you'd all know. Sanchez was a Princeton Arts Fellow, a recipient of the 21st Century Award from the Chicago Public Library Foundation and a recipient of the National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship. She is currently a professor of English at DePaul University in Chicago. We are so honored tonight that she will be in, following a short reading, conversation with, I'm not I, I, that clause didn't work, but I'm sorry. Uh, with Associate Professor Stephanie Rivera Perus, a co director of the Center for Race, Ethnicity, and In Indigeneity. Did, is that right? Thank you. Um, and she is also in the Department of Philosophy at Marquette University. Um, it is so, uh, such an honor, really, to have both of them. And honestly, it's an honor to have all of you as well. So let's give them a big hand. Thank you all. Thank you so much for being here. It means a lot to me. It's Friday night and you're here talking about books. It's just so sweet. Um, and, and thank you to Boswell. It's such an honor to, 
be part of this series. And thank you to Stephanie and thank you to um, Jesus and Buddha and the universe for this beautiful life that I have. So I'm gonna read a little bit from Down to Clown. It's on page 43. I had another group of friends in junior high who could be best described as a gaggle of misfits. We were dorky girls who would spend recess quoting The Simpsons and roasting everyone, including each other. Jenny was overweight and very self-conscious about it. Her family life was mysterious, but I did know her father was an abusive drug addict. We were friends with her for years and never once stepped inside her house. One of Jenny's recurring bits was about Elf, the hit TV show from the 90s about an alien living with a suburban family and the eponymous character's appetite for cats. Nadia was a skinny girl with big eyes and gigantic gums and protruding teeth, later treated by braces, who hated her mother with a fervor I couldn't quite understand. She was obsessed with Marilyn Manson and would sarcastically destroy anyone who even looked in our direction. Then there was Vanessa, who was the most normal and well-adjusted. She had a loving family and a positive outlook on life. The only thing strange about her was that she was short, like for real short. And I, of course, was deeply was a deeply depressed smartass. I painted my nails black and loved disco inspired clothing for reasons I still can't understand. I wore a lot of polyester, which is a poor choice when you're going through puberty and your sweat glands are out of control. Trauma or alienation had brought us together and we laughed in spite of it or because of it, it's hard to say. Those moments in which we lost our shit over Kermit the Frog or some kid in our class who looked like an armadillo were pure bliss, some of the best moments of my sad teenage existence. I watched The Simpsons every weekday, sometimes multiple times a day, from the ages of five to 17. Since I was prone to sulking and brooding, my parents were pleased to see me laugh for the duration of the episodes. I thought the show was brilliant and loved its irreverence toward the world. It taught me to revel in absurdity and brought me comfort like nothing else could. Lisa Simpson was the first feminist icon I had come across. I wanted to be just like her, except slightly less annoying. I had the Simpsons t-shirts, posters, toys, and action figures. It remains my most longstanding and codependent relationship. I use the show to gauge a person's intelligence and general likability. Whoever thought it was crass and juvenile was dead to me essentially. At a very tender age, I decided I wanted to be tough and talk shit. I was about 13 when I watched Janine Garofalo perform stand-up. For a few years, my family had an illegal hot box. Seriously, that's what it was called. So we were able to get free cable. To our chagrin, companies caught on and they became obsolete shortly after we began using them. During the brief era of the Sanchez family hotbox, Comedy Central became one of my favorite channels, and I would watch reruns of stand-up specials over and over again because I had few friends and nothing better to do. Janine Garofalo instantly became my idol. I loved how edgy and cool she was in that 90s sort of way, with her red shorts, black tights, and chunky black shoes. Though she was self-deprecating, she exuded the kind of confidence I wanted. She knew exactly who she was and didn't say she was sorry. I want to be like her, I thought to myself. I want to be funny and strong. Thank you. All right. Thank you all for being here. I'm so excited. It's such an honor to be in conversation with you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I, I guess I'll just jump in. I, I think for me and probably a lot of readers of this of this book, it was uh, 
like finding my own very thoughts on a page, right? And seeing myself in words in ways that maybe I hadn't experienced before. Um, and lines, particularly from the first, from the introduction, um, and I'm gonna quote you here. I rarely found portrayals of anyone like me. Uh, for us, resilience is more than a noble trait. Um, and in my own work, these are things and issues that often come up, but because the academy sometimes sucks you dry, you can't write about them. So it was such a pleasure to see them written. So Thank you. one of the main threads of the work of your work um, that I noticed had to do with the focus that the book has on the material experience of what it means to be alive, right? And what it means to feel deeply, what it means to be sad, what it means to be, um, crying, crying in a bathroom. <laughs> and to that, if, to that extent, I, I wanted to just open the conversation with you to, to share a little bit more about what it was like to translate those experiences, right? What was it like to write, particularly a memoir, right? About yourself um, in these, from these very material and affected places. You know, no one has asked me about that until now and so that's amazing <laughs> I, I love that interpretation we had 30 seconds to prep <laughs> sorry <laughs> no it's great no I I think that it's a central piece of uh, a central thread of the book as you point out of uh, the what it means to exist in a in a human body right and what it means to like have ailments and to have a mental illness and what that actually physically feels like and for me it, the best writers, the writers that I gravitate towards are those who can make me feel exactly the way that the character mm. is feeling or the speaker, if it's poetry, is feeling. And so I think I learned from them. I learned from like, you know, Sharon Olds and Sandra Cisneros and Toni Morrison, et cetera. I can go on and on. Um, I, I think it's important for the reader to really embody what what the um, person, the, the narrator is, is experiencing. And I think um, I spend so much time thinking of descriptions and how to portray that and how to communicate that. And I, and I obsess over it, honestly. Like I'm like always thinking of images of, of, of the way that it, it hurts to, to be alive sometimes. Like how does it hurt? Just, just being alive, right. you know. Um, what is that like? And and writing the book made me really go to those places and re-experience all of that. But also, there was healing in that experience. So I, I'm really glad I did it. Yeah. And I'm glad that you can feel it. Oh, yeah. um, that that means a lot to me because that that's exactly what I was striving for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There were, um, and I don't know how many of us have finished the book yet, or we're in process of, but um, I certainly found myself sitting on the floor a lot. <laughs> and I was like, why am I reading on the floor? <laughs> why? Yeah, or like taking breaks in places where I was like, I am very much feeling right um there's a lot of feeling that's happening as i'm reading these words and books don't always invoke that right and i think that's a testament to the way you were able to really conjure up the affect right of your own experiences which at the same time i think are quite shared right yeah um, it's very human it's very human yes and it's beautiful to know that other people experience the same things right yeah, yeah. to know that yeah um yeah thank you so much how long did it take you to write this book about six years okay yeah wow. yeah I started it right around the time that I finished Mexican Daughter and it was going to be published mm -hmm. and I needed a new project and someone had asked me to write an essay and I wrote Crying in the Bathroom the title essay uh for an anthology and that was that I was like oh I have to do this I have to write the truth like the literal mm -hmm. truth and it's so different yeah. from writing fiction because yeah. there's no hiding you know right. it's like this is me and I did these things and I said yeah. these things right. and I thought these things so I don't know it, it, people are really stunned by how um intimate it is but that's the only way I know how to write yeah I that's the, if I don't do that yeah. then I, I feel like 
I'm, I, I'm missing the point. Right, right, right. Yeah, the integrity mm -hmm. of, the, of the writing itself. Right, yeah. Is it, is it, uh, is writing hard? Does oh it drain God. you? Or yes. is it something that just, because I mean, that was one of the things you talked about often in, in the text itself was your own relationship to writing, right? And mm -hmm. sometimes it was the lifeline, but that doesn't necessarily mean it was e an easy thing to do. It's never been easy for me. It's been like pleasurable and joyful at times, but it, in the grand scheme of things, it's extremely challenging. And I feel like every book for me gets harder and harder mm. because I, I can't write the same book twice. And I, I feel like I have to challenge myself in doing something really different so I could like feel alive while I'm writing it. Right. Otherwise I'm just bored. And then if I'm bored, you're bored. <laughs> you're bored. So, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's no good. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about humor? I, I was so, I appreciated this chapter so much. Um, how uh, not just, you know, the politics of humor, right? And who, who can be funny? Who is supposed to be funny? When can we activate the funniness? And it's, you know, okay. It's not us. It's definitely not <laughs> you and I, um, but man, do I use it. And, um, and so, but also um, someone flags for me with conversation. Uh, we were having a conversation about just sound, right? That humor also occupies this like space right that mm -hmm. comes out of the mouth and is in space and um I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about how your own relationship to humor evolved as you were writing this I realized how important it was to my life and how it was a lifeline throughout my really terrible moments that I was able to find humor in the worst situations and that for some reason um well, I guess it's 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 like a spiritual sort of experience, I think, mm -hmm. humor, where mm -hmm. you 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 kind of forget your your ailments in a way, because you're you're like laughing at them and in a way you're just like separated from them. I don't know how to explain it yet, but I'm working it out. Um, but I think that for me, humor is the way that I, I just have to exist or, or else I'm, I'm very depressed. Mm -hmm. Um, if I'm not laughing, I'm depressed, you know, <laughs> yes. cause I laugh at all things. And, um, you know, it's, it's so funny that I fell in love with a comedian, uh, who no longer <laughs> does stand up because he doesn't like it anymore, but he is still <laughs> extremely funny. And so I'm like laughing all the time and I never imagined that my life could be like that yeah, yeah. because I spent so much of my life depressed um but going back to um humor and and like taking up space yeah I I laugh really loudly and you know certain people don't enjoy they don't it. Like it they don't like it <laughs> and I think <laughs> it's that they don't like us taking up space. Yeah. They don't like us existing. Yeah. They don't like us being happy. Um, and I think that, you know, the same thing goes for my novel being banned. It's like, so people just don't like the idea of a Mexican girl because that's that's what's on the cover. That's that's the title. And so it just is it feels so incredibly racist to me um to to shun that sort of identity or experience, you know, and it just, it gets me very riled up. <laughs> <laughs> to make jokes about it. <laughs> and I have to make jokes <laughs> and I laugh harder. So <laughs> get mad. you're not crying. Of yeah. course. But thank you so much. Um, let's see. So I, so another thing I noticed, um, and this was, this were, little blips in the writing, but you talked about trees. And this is a, a personal, this is a, Stephanie's up here asking you questions. I get MC privileges, but I love trees. I am obsessed really. Um, I have one tattooed on my, like I, I'm really obsessed. I love it. And so I wanted to know more because you noted a few times you're like, yes. And then there was this tree and it was part of this experience. And I was like, what happened to the tree? <laughs> Tell me more about the tree. It just remained beautiful, you know, uh, as they do. Um, I think for me, trees are, are 
very um, human-like sometimes in the way that they they look, the way that they're like hunched over or or the, the leaves are falling a certain way. I don't know. They look like bodies to me, yeah. like human bodies oftentimes. And and they they're so old oftentimes as well. And like they hold so much knowledge, their own kind of tree knowledge that I don't understand. But I, I have always felt very drawn to them. I have always like felt like some sort of kinship with with trees. And I think it's very mysterious. And actually, um, Sandra Cisneros also realized that that I, I talked a lot about trees. <laughs> and she's like, I too have this yeah. very yeah. Yeah. special relationship with trees. Yeah. And so we haven't talked it through yet, but I'm like, there's, there's some there's something the there like what is that <laughs> they're just so majestic sometimes yeah. and I, I'm in awe of them yeah. like constantly yeah I always I often wonder what the world looks like from what we look like from their perspective oh that's yeah because I mean they've been here longer than yes been here, right yes. so like what must the perspective be of these creatures right that we're here just fucking shit, <laughs> shit up. up so bad yeah so bad <laughs> <laughs> And a few of us stop along the way, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I was, uh, I was just super curious about the trees. Um, I think another one of the major threads that I that's throughout the, the length of uh, your book is um, the nature of freedom, right? What does it mean to articulate a life the way you want it, right? And what are the conditions by which that becomes possible, Right. It's not just that I want to do X, but there's a whole host of conditions that have to hold in order for certain possibilities to even show up. Right. Yeah. And um, on page 175, specifically, if anybody I'm referencing, right, um, the ability, the way you talked about it in this instance was linked up to sexual freedom. And I absolutely adored the fact that in the way you described it was your the ability to forget oneself to be able to dissolve in some kind of way, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think that has extension. I think there's something really profound about the way in which it seems like when freedom shows up truly, right? We can detach from this egoness of who we are. Exactly. And yeah, so I, I was curious about ways in which you saw, you know, how are you thinking about freedom now that you're on the other side of writing a memoir about yeah. your experiences? Well, Freedom for me is is the ability to make my own choices and to be who I am in the world. And I think for women of color, it's just so difficult to be who you are with no repercussions. Right. Like right. There, people always have opinions. People always have things to say. Um, if, if you behave a certain way, then people assume that you're not professional or, you know, or you're stupid or, you know, there's always like this constant chatter in our heads about what people are going to make of us because of the way that we are. And, and I realized this recently how traumatized I've been in like white spaces, always trying to perform, like overachieve. So then I could be taken seriously so I could make money. So I could like have the life that I want, the life that I finally have. But that came at such a cost. Like, oh my God, I've had so many breakdowns just because I, I thought like I wasn't good enough. I wasn't trying hard enough. And that's like so terrible for your mental health. And um, I, I don't want my students to experience that. I don't want anyone else to experience that. Um, it's you know, what, what is the world allowing us to do? Like, what are the limitations? So we have free will, sure. But then we live in a society that is super racist, super patriarchal, misogynist, etc. And so like, within those confines, like, how can we find freedom? Mm -hmm. It's really difficult. And, you know, I, I think I have moments of freedom. But then I have another moment where, you know, someone reminds me that I'm an other, right. and then I don't feel free. I feel like, you know, stick or ostracized or whatever. And so I feel like, you know, how this feels and I want to hear about your experiences. <laughs> about the lack of freedom. Yeah. Well, like what, how can one be free right. in these conditions? Well, that, I mean, I think that's just it. I, it's, I, 
I'm not sure that it's a it's a state. I, I think that's one of the big misnomers we have is this idea that freedom is an accomplishment, mm -hmm. that it's an object, that it's static, it's that ongoing, I can, that I can that I can own it, that it's capital, right? Rather than something that is ongoing, that is a process and certainly like self-related, right? In order to get to a place where you could experience freedom, right? There is some self-work that also has to happen to get you there. Right, yeah. No, it's not easy. I didn't wake up and, and decide to feel liberated. Yeah, but like, exactly. You know? <laughs> Although when you read stuff on it, sometimes you're like, oh, is it that simple? I just wake up, ija, like here we are, right? It really isn't it, that and it simple. Isn't. It isn't, yeah. yeah. It, it isn't at all um yeah and the 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 links to mental health i think this is another i think so important dimension of your work is that you're really honest about it and i think we seldom are very honest about what's happening behind the scenes because no one sees right when you're crying in bathrooms right mm -hmm. um and the fact that it was so honest, right? I mean, I was very deeply grateful to see myself on pages, but also thought about every single person who read this and was like, oh yeah, this happens to me too, right? I'm not the only one who experiences these things. Um, and that there, there's, there's a, a space of freedom in there also. Um, and so I was curious, what was that like? What was that process like, particularly talking about, you know, something that is so deeply private, I think, in the ways in which we cash it out. It is, um, and and the thing is, for me, it's been a part of my life since I was a child. So I've been carrying this for so long. And you know, I wrote a book of poetry about my mental illness. I mean, it it, it covers other ground, but it, it it's it's mostly about that. Uh, my novel is about mental illness, and then this is about mental illness, and it's it's because I can't let it go mm -hmm. because it still occupies space in me and I have to like figure out a way to deal with it to transform it into something to make it have meaning mm -hmm. and so um it doesn't really scare me to talk about it it scares me not to talk about mm -hmm. it you know um I think silence is what what kills a lot of us and so um I wanted to be really loud about it like this is the kind of pain that I experienced and um, so many people have also felt that and, and they feel seen by that. And like, how often do we ever feel seen as brown women? It's right. just so rare. So, um, it means a lot to me when people tell me like that they connected in that way, because we don't really talk about it no. as a culture. No. Yeah. 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 And then within that, right. Your own, the, the cultural norms of wherever you may come from, right. Um, of navigating, uh having bodies that feel right i mean i think again we come back to this question of the human experience right we all feel right but how do we experience the world through those feelings varies and so um yeah i was i was very moved i was very very moved Thank by you. by that chapter um in particular and i know it came at the end i had to take breaks and that's when i was like i'm sitting on the floor like reading this <laughs> and i have to make it through the week <laughs> It resonated <laughs> deeply. It should have come with like a, a, a cozy blanket or something. <laughs> it should. They should sell it with, a, with something warm or smells like mint, right? Like something <laughs> to offset everything that's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Like, exactly. Um, so I, I have a few kind of last general questions, and then I think we'll start opening up for the audience. But I was curious you know, were there, what were the highs? What was the highs of writing this book? And what were the lows, right? What what was the, you know, where in the process of those six years were, were the highest moments? Um, and then on the flip side, were there lows? And, and if so, what, what were they? Um, the highs were mostly when I would hit a nice stride and I would like make myself laugh and like really yeah. please myself and feel joy <laughs> writing yeah, yeah, because that's the reason that I write is because it, it makes me feel alive. And so that happened throughout the low moments, I, I suppose were mostly um, during uh, Difficult Sun, that chapter, because it was about the worst uh, depression I've ever experienced. And so 
I really had to go back to that space yeah. and relive it and try to remember all the terrible things that happened and piece it together. And it was just really hard. And I remember just crying a lot because that's what I do. And, um, you know, I would get massages at times and um, I would try to take care of myself, but but it still was excruciating. Mm -hmm. But at the end, it felt liberating. It felt like I had achieved something really important. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So I think we'll we'll transition to make the conversation wider. Questions for Erika? No one's gotten mad at me yet. Oh, that I know wow. of. I mean, to my face. <laughs> so, um, I guess I don't really think about repercussions. I'm like, I wrote it. If you don't like it, you know, see you later. You know, yeah, what, yeah. what can I do? I can't it's really consult people about my book. So, but I, I, that's a very like legitimate question. Like, do people feel some kind of way about their portrayals. And, you know, my mom is not going to read the book because my mom does not want to know about my depression in that way. Like she just can't, she's sensitive like me. So um, she's cho chosen not to, but she's very supportive. And so I, I really think that's a great choice. Um, my brothers loved it. My husband loves it. Um, someone asked me like, how did it feel for your husband that you wrote about having sex with other people I was like what, yeah. what a weird question like what, what? like as if you weren't a whole person right I like, I had a whole life <laughs> I had a whole life before you showed we, up we were we met when we were like 35 <laughs> like what and he and he's a comedian he thinks it's all funny he doesn't care um yeah. he's very sweet and proud and um yeah I haven't I haven't received any like you know, negative feedback. Um, I'm sure people talk about it behind my back, but that's fine. <laughs> I'm okay with that. I don't need to know. <laughs> yes. In fact, I feel a poem just like bursting out of me. So I need to find some time because it's been, it's been hard with the touring and my baby and teaching, but Poetry is my base. I'm always going to write poetry. That's that's my core. That's what makes me feel the most alive. Oh, yes. You know, when I was really, really, really depressed, I didn't think I'd ever write again. And that's what scared me. I was like, I this is it. I can't do this anymore. I felt like my my life had been taken from me, even though I was alive. I didn't I didn't feel alive, and so um, I I was like, well, I you know I won't be able to write again. So what's the point? And um, when I recovered finally, it was so exciting to read again, to write again, because those were my my two true loves in life that, you know, I've been reading and, and writing like this since I was a little girl. And so um, to be able to transform that experience into an essay uh, that I hope is beautiful, then it, it really changed something for me. It made it meaningful. It made it like it, it not worth it because I mean, that's a weird thing to say about it, but it, it, it made it so that it wasn't all in vain, you know, and that other people could connect to it. And the more people connect to it, the more healed I feel, you know, it's, it's really incredible to like open up your heart like that and have so many people uh, respond in, in such a kind way. Thank you.
Thank you. Mm -hmm. I was looking at comments earlier. You said, you know, the difference between a novel that this is real or that this is true. And I would argue that fiction is just as true. I agree. But the memoir is reality. But mm -hmm. I think the fiction is just as true as reading. Yeah, I guess I meant literal truth. <laughs> yeah, like this actually happened. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. The things we carry, Tim O'Brien. Uh huh. Saying, None of the things in this book happened, but all of them were detailed. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that is the case for Mexican Daughter for sure. Um, it, it didn't happen exactly like that, but the feelings and a lot of the situations are very true to my life. And, right. Right. Yeah, there are different forms of truth. And um, I think about that in terms of poetry, what what does truth mean? Truth equals beauty, according to Keats, and I agree. Like if it's beautiful, it's truthful. Um, and you know, with fiction, it's different. With memoir, it's different. And so, um, it's it's all tapping into the human experience somehow. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness oh I'm flattered um I well let's let's define chingona for those who may not know what chingona is uh chingona in Mexican Spanish means like fucker literally but it means like a woman who is a badass who is really cool who does what she wants and you know I've always looked to those women always so you know I, I met, mentioned Sandra Cisneros I, re, I remember reading her poetry and I was like I want to be like her you know she's off in Europe gallivanting you know with all these lovers I was yeah. like that's cool <laughs> you know I, I really found that enticing and then um I remember even like Elaine Benes I was very intrigued by her because I used to watch Seinfeld all the time like oh she lives by herself like that's cool <laughs> you know I was really into that um and so for me, I, I just, I've looked for, for mentors, uh, examples, and, you know, my mom is a chingona in her own way, even though she doesn't think she is, you know, like she's, she's a very strong, resilient person who's done a lot. And she just, I wish she knew that about herself. Um, she calls me chingona all the time. And I'm like, you're chingona, you know, like you don't even know. Um, <laughs> and, and it's such a compliment, you know, especially from your mother. Um, I think it's important for young women to be friends to themselves, to be kind to themselves, to not be friends with people that are not kind to them, to make choices based on what is best for them, um, to not like acquiesce to men because that's what is expected um it's all about choices and agency in my classes I'm always talking to my students about agency and that's like determining your own life by doing what you want and so um you know one one girl she's like my dad won't let me major in English because uh or in writing because he wants me to be uh whatever you know I don't even remember and I was like you don't have to listen to your dad like what's like no <laughs> no it's just we don't have to do that right you know and especially if you're like paying your own bills like yeah. listening to other people like excuse me like <laughs> get out of my face um and so I try to like to to mentor these young women who come into my classes to to have that sort of mentality of like you know pursuing their dreams and and doing what they want, regardless of what other people may think.
I did not. I was. <laughs> no you're right no i was too weird for a continued on my mom was like what kind of dress what, what, what are we, doing? Are we gonna what are do we here doing? like it just no and then also i was like very very um anti-social so i would have just been scowling the whole time um but maybe i'll give my daughter one just just for fun you know but like a chingona can sing it she could wear a suit if she wants. You 100%. Know? Yes. <laughs> Best. <laughs> yeah, maybe I will have one still. You still have Multiply. one. Multiply. Uh huh. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm really obnoxious about it. First of all, <laughs> I don't let people forget that I'm Mexican. Um, it's something that I talk about a great deal just in everyday life. Um, and so I think it's it's a beautiful identity and we should celebrate it. And there are so many things about our culture that are beautiful and valuable and, and that, you know, mainstream culture really likes too. like we're I mean let's think about our food everybody wants to eat Mexican food all the time um and I think we bring so much to the table and we're not allowed often in those in many spaces right in academia um in the arts whatever and so for me the way that I address that lack is trying to bring people up you know like um pull as I climb as they say and so I I really care a lot about my students I care a lot about younger writers who are coming up um I try to put people on all the time and and I you know I make sure that people understand that I'm very happy that I'm Mexican and that my parents are immigrants and that we're the shit, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's back there. Oh, Buddhism? Yeah, it helped a great deal because Buddhism gave me all of these tools that I didn't have before. Um, Buddhism gave me like a, a, such a strong foundation to be a strong person um, in understanding the law of cause and effect that everything I do has a consequence, that um, I can turn poison into medicine, that um, I should be empathetic with all beings. And um, it, it made me a better person ultimately because it, it made me see the world very differently. Um, and so I think that understanding that, that sometimes transformation hurts, that always it hurts actually, that that understanding helped me complete the book because I'm like it, it hurts but it's worth it. it it hurts but it's going to heal it hurts but it's going to you know um, reach a lot of people and so I suppose that's the way that it's it's helped me in my journey <laughs> they do want me to write another book that's true um I'm just not ready yet 
um, I, I have a short attention span and um, I like to make my life harder as my mother would like to say. <laughs> and so I was like, I'm going to write something totally different. It, hopefully it works out, you know, but it, I felt so passionate about it that there was no stopping me. Like to me, I don't, I don't think about the money per se. Like I've never written because of money. I've written because I love writing and the, the money was like a really nice surprise but um i don't that's not what motivates me you know what i'm saying and so they they could ask me all they want to write another book and maybe i'll write one like 15 years from now when i'm ready i don't know i'm just kind of like a jerk in that way where <laughs> i just don't care we never make money on books so it doesn't really matter <laughs> One more question. Oh, there's some hands over here. Hello. I try very much to make my students feel seen and heard um, because I don't think that happens oftentimes in a college classroom. At least that was my experience. I didn't think I was yeah. really that important. Um, but I want them to know that I actually care about what they think. And um, I encourage them to share parts of them in my class and try to make them feel safe um, in order to do that. And there, there's a, um, a sort of like trust that you have to build from the beginning. And I, I, I work really hard at that. And it's a lot of emotional labor, but it's really worth it because I feel like then they trust me with what I'm saying and with the material that I'm presenting. I always teach books by uh, people of color. Um, rarely do I ever teach a, a, a text by a white person because I feel like that they're going to learn that elsewhere. And this is the classroom where they get to learn about other types of people or people like themselves as well. And so, um, I, yeah, it's, it's something that I've really cultivated over the years. And I, I, I love teaching. I realized, um, I, I didn't always, but now I do because I, I feel this sort of like connection to my students that, I didn't before because I'm much more comfortable with who I am and my teaching styles. And I, I have a lot of fun and they have fun too. Sometimes I take them out to pizza, you know, things like that. Um, a lot of them come to office hours to talk to me about certain things. And I, I try to be open-minded. I try to be the professor that I never had, honestly. Yeah. But was there another part of your question? Yeah. Well, I'm not one of those regimented people. Um, I don't wake up at like five o'clock. I wake up at five o'clock because of my daughter, but not because of writing. Um, and I I write when I can. It, it comes in bursts. Um, I have a whole office to myself. I have the whole entire attic of my house, which is uh, incredible. I can't believe that that's my space. And so I spend a lot of time there. I pace, I, I go on walks. I, I take many walks. Um, I write notes. Um, I, you know, do writing exercises with colors and I, I paint, I draw, you know, it's, it's hard to really explain. It's just, it's just all over the place. I can't really pin it down. I never know what's going to inspire me. It could happen at any moment. And that's really that's a, that's a really cool way to live, I think, you know, just like waiting to be inspired. Um, and it happens frequently. So I don't know how helpful that is, but that's, that's how I do it. <laughs> awesome. All right. <laughs>
<laughs> well, join me in thanking. No. <laughs> um, are we transitioning to book signing at this moment? Okay. Um, I don't know the protocol for that, but that's what's happening now. Um, <laughs> so uh, join me in thanking Erica for such a lovely conversation. And then I will give over the floor for this process. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to let everybody know, I have a few uh, announcements. Um, our friend uh, Barbara Cerda is there. She's from Larevo uh, Online and Pop-Up Bookstore. Please say hi to her. Um, you'll see her in lots of places. And yeah. <laughs> I also wanted to let you know that um, we did have a limit on crying. Oh, some of our books are still in the warehouse, um, but we can raise the limit because we have enough books. Just if you want to buy 10, you can. And also, I just wanted to say thanks to... Um, Vintage Espanol. We actually have Yorando en Albaño, which is actually officially out next Tuesday, but they are letting us sell the books early, uh, which we are very grateful. And I also want to say we have to sell out of your poetry book, Lessons on Expulsion, so um, because it's very important. So <laughs> we don't have that many, so it's a it's a low bar, but um, we <laughs> we would like we would like to sell out anyway. So um, I wanted to thank both of you, professors for a wonderful conversation.